Welcome everyone to the Strickland Distinguished Scholars webinar series. I'm your host, Martha Narkunas, speaking to you tonight from the Public History Program, Middle Tennessee State University. I'll be joined by Dr. Pankari Dubey as our question moderator. I'm an oral and public historian with research interests in memory, power, landscape, and gender. Dr. Dubey studies the memory of partition, the relocation of populations, indigenous lands, and the impact on the environment. Tonight's webinar is entitled Inclusive Approaches to Historic Preservation, Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Ability. We're honored to be joined tonight by Strickland Distinguished Scholar Speaker, Dr. Gail Dubrow, Professor of Architecture and History at University of Minnesota. She's a Distinguished Professor of the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture and a Fellow of the Society of Architectural Historians. She's the author of Cento at Sixth and Main with Donna Graves and Restoring Women's History Through Historic Preservation with Jennifer Goodwin, Goodman, as well as scholarly articles, handbooks, theme study for the National Park Service, professional reports, and many public documents. She's been the recipient of many awards and grants, among them the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Museum of American History, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Historic Places Award, and the Best Book Award from the Society of Architectural Historians. Before we begin, I have a few thank yous to make. A special thank you to Victoria Richardson, Dr. Lynn Nelson, and the Strickland Committee in the History Department, and Dr. Emily Barron, Chair of the History Department. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the Strickland family for their support for the webinar series. The Strickland Endowment honors the legacy of Roscoe L. Strickland Jr. and Lucy Strickland. Roscoe L. Strickland was a founding member of the university's history department, and Lucy Strickland was a faculty member at MTSU and the first president of the Murfreesboro League of Women Voters. Their endowment helps the history department in many ways, not least of which is in bringing distinguished scholars to campus and to share their ideas via webinars. I'd especially like to thank Rocky Strickland for his vision and his ongoing support. We're going to talk tonight for about 50 minutes or so and then take questions from the audience. Please feel free to post questions in the Q&A. Dr. Dubé will be gathering questions for the last segment of the webinar. Our webinar will be closed captioned. So thank you so, so much, Gail, for joining us tonight. I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you for the invitation to join you. So well, why don't we just get started by, we talked a little before when we've been chatting. Uh, you grew up in the Bronx. Uh, how did you go from the Bronx to your interest in architecture and placemaking? Yeah, well, um, when I was growing up, I was interested in the arts. And I um, had the opportunity in the summer prior to applying to college to get exposed to the, all of the art and architecture fields in one summer. And I just was smitten by being introduced to the architect of the Ford Foundation building and getting to see his work. It just seemed like a field where I could bring together so many of my interests. And so I left um, New York to head to the West Coast to architecture school at the University of Oregon. And as I went through those programs, I became interested in social history, but it was not my major. My major was architecture, and then um, I got my PhD in planning from UCLA eventually. So unlike many of your colleagues um, in public history and historic preservation and other fields, my training was not in history. I was just excited by the developments in the field of history. But then you were also interested in uh, English and women's studies. Yes. I, I'm kind of a curious person in both senses of the word. But what I learned from English was I loved literature and mostly I wanted to learn how to write. 
And so I had, I was in the rare position among other architecture faculty of being actually directly taught to write, not only to draw. So I feel like it's, it was a decision that served me very well over time. I must say you are a, a beautiful writer. Um, I've been looking, reviewing a lot of your work in the past few weeks and yeah. Uh, when you went to, you went on to do your master's work at UCLA. Uh, is, was it there that you met Dolores Hayden and got involved in the power of place? So I had a one-year transition to UCLA to enter its doctoral program, actually. And I intentionally sought her out as a mentor because by that time, I cared so much about, well, the social movement in terms of women's rights and justice. Um, and was looking and had read some of her work and was fascinated by it. But she had not done work on historic preservation previously. She had worked on women in planning history, essentially. And so I got very lucky that when I went there and started their doctoral program, a new study had come out from the state of California called Five Views. And it was the first statewide study that started to identify multicultural sites. And Hayden took up this question of how might you save and interpret the places that they had discovered, gathering communities around particular sites in Los Angeles. Now, some people are mistaken about the power of place project she came up with, thinking its intention was to be multicultural, and it was. And it was in terms of incorporating women's history, but really it threaded the theme of labor through all those histories. What kind of work built the city of Los Angeles? Was it Mulholland who brought water over the mountains or was it Irish laborers? Was it Henry Huntington who built the streetcars or um, workers of many ethnicities who laid the tracks. And so it really was a labor history of Los Angeles that moved away from the great men and looked at the work of people in the city. And I had the opportunity to work on a Japanese American site. And um, for that reason, um, it gave me a little taste of what work I might do in the future, while also finding a place for women's history within preservation. And I ended up writing my dissertation under Dolores's supervision um, on women's history. Um, and it kind of got me launched in the world. Why, how did you end up doing writing the entry on Japanese sites? I was paid to work for her as a graduate assistant, and um, we held these public community forums for people who had memories of sites to tell their stories. And as an oral historian, you understand, um, years ago, a uh, really important preservationist in California wrote an article called Birds of a Feather in the Public Historian. And it was about the relationship between oral history and historic preservation. Hayden made a really important point that these aren't these are only histories of places that are not fully documented for a thousand reasons. And while there are methods to finding the first black fire station or first integrated fire station or this site of flower fields and some of the first fruit trees in downtown Los Angeles at the Japanese American Community and Cultural Center. The point was we're not gonna be able to understand the meaning of these sites unless we gather oral histories of place. And I thought it was a really important methodological innovation that no matter how much you can or can't find in the written record, if there is memory, around, it's possible to reconstruct the meaning of place. And you're going to get such a different idea of the places that matter to regular people 
rather than sort of the governor's mansion or well i i actually believe there is no place that can't be presented from multiple perspectives and i know you share this view a multivocal perspective so whether it's the governor's mansion or home of a president or the first fire station in los angeles to be integrated depending on who's telling the story there are multiple perspectives on it yeah and we are definitely going to talk about that we know that <laughs> Um, I'm just thinking of the great folklorist Achi Green, whose first question when he saw a building was, who built it? Who made the bricks? Who sawed the wood? My uh, last one is, who maintains it? Yeah, yeah. So I just have to do a little show and tell. So this is that wonderful brochure, which I showed Gail earlier, that I happen to have on the power of place. That's just a beautifully... Um, evocative of the different sites of memory to the different communities there. And you also worked, did you also work with Paige Putnam Miller on Reclaiming the Past and her work in the early 90s on women's landmarks? Just about the time that I was graduating as a doctoral student and wondering how my focus on women's history was gonna play out on the job market, like not that well, was my prediction. Um, Paige, um, who was based in Washington and really doing lobbying for the historical profession, along with insiders in the Park Service, allies like Heather Hike, a career Park Service person who was one of the earliest people to focus on women's history, and um, her allies. Um, who have appeared in the Strickland series, like Dwight Pickaithley, who became chief historian soon um, after she started lobbying around, around women's history sites in the Park Service. The women who were really kind of at the core of the historical profession got together and asked the question, where are the sites for women? Women are half the population, and they're three. And by my count, they were about three percent of all sites, and that includes all the terrible sites, like of indigenous an indigenous woman supposedly jumping off a cliff to find her lover below. I mean, all the terrible stereotypical sites, all the wives and mothers, and then um, a few important sites and. Women in the historical profession, as you will recall, were very well organized. They had Berkshire Conference on Women's History. There's a lot of foment. Um, women were gaining senior status in history departments. And it was a fight, right? So the, then the question started to turn not just from what scholarship needs to correct, like the standard view of American history built around presidents and battlefields, which women pretty much were excluded from, to a very different social history oriented view, and to the question of what about in public, in museums, in historical exhibits. So within each of these institutions, I would say, there was one or more women. At the Smithsonian, it was Edith Mayo. For Paige, it was an overview of many historical organizations. For Heather, it was the Park Service. Each of them were saying, here I am. I know about this scholarship in women's history, and I'm looking at the inventory, and it's pretty dismal. Something needs to be done. And Paige managed to work with others to lobby for a congressional appropriation that added 40 new sites related to women. It was for the National Historic Landmark Pro Program. And as this audience surely knows, those are the kind of highest level of um, sites in terms of their significance and integrity. So I worked closely with Paige and others to help write those nominations. 
for new landmarks, as well as to contribute to her book, Reclaiming the Past. Which is, again, you know, enormously influential in the field of preserving women's history and marking sites on the landscape. So I have to ask this because sometimes I get uh, a bit distraught about it, but a lot of the argument she made um, 27 years before you published the article on intersectionality and historic preservation was to redo historic preservation standards of significance because they disenfranchised groups other than elite white males, um, prioritized stories over architectural significance, um, and uh, uh, think about places that were important to marginalized groups that that didn't that didn't have any architectural integrity or consistently over time. So you argued for a lot of those same things in the brilliant article that you wrote with Donna Graves on intersectionality. Has have you seen much in the way of change in the last 27 years? Since that time, many groups have organized and the Park Service has created openings for groups formally excluded to study sites significant in their history, right? There's a Latino stud heritage study, an LGBTQ study, and now there's a handbook being written about site significant and disability history. What I wanna say from the outset is each group has raised these concerns about whether standards of significance and expectations regarding integrity make any sense. Now, we've done a lot of our work within the National Historic Landmark Program, which requires the highest levels of that. And what I would say is, it's debatable. I could take either position about issues of integrity are too strong or just right for the NHL program. But overall, in the field of preserving resources, not every property is a National Historic Landmark. It might have state significance. It might have local significance. But what I want to say for everyone to hear clearly is, if you were property, and now we're talking about what property is associated with you, slavery, for example, it's unlikely you had control over saving it all these years till we rediscovered it, correct? And many were seen as a blight. Let's remove the slave quarters. Or, um, you know, for sites associated with Cesar Chavez, one very modest church, Ray Rast has led the campaign to really think through integrity in terms of why in the world would you expect this humble church not to have been changed over time? So with each successive inclusive act, there have been mounting concerns about these standards. And what I wanna say is once you have like 16 calls, from different groups to rethink this question of how a hundred years after it's the historical events happened, 50 years or less, how we could expect for oppressed groups that integrity would be the same as those who had the, oh, I don't know, I think we're talking about the filthy lucre earned from evil to maintain their railroad mansions or other sites. What are we have to rethink our expectations, but as long as we only consider it from the standpoint, say, of women or African Americans or one group, one particular group, we're not going to see the big picture that the larger policies and practices were created around a very narrow set of sites, and that 
those who made the decisions about them were a narrow group. And we all were not asked what we think. And now that we've been asked, we have some really serious questions. I think you're pointing to the future of historic preservation, where we don't just collect sites that reflect diversity, but we ask ourselves how we do historic preservation. One small example that I know will resonate for the folks attending this. Um, we knew we needed to consult with community over sites deemed ethnographically significant to indigenous people. What do you know? Et cetera. It's a kind of new notion that there might be other kinds of communities who have to be asked and consulted with. So I would just leave it at that for the moment. Well, that does bring us back to that notion of intersectionality. And would you, uh, for the people in the audience who have no clear idea, would you explain a little what that means and then talk about your uh, beautifully innovative work with Donna Graves to apply it to historic preservation? Sure. Well, let's go back to Paige Miller's book. At the time, best knowledge available. She picked, I mean, I was a puppy. I was little. I was just graduating from graduate school. I knew very little. But the senior scholars who she included really were the state of the art. It was what we knew at the time. She didn't exclude anyone. It's just what we knew then, like we knew different things in 1865, right? So there was pretty robust scholarship on white women. There was modest scholarship on black women. And there was very little scholarship indeed on women of color beyond that. Now we know better, so we have to do better. And the do better runs along two lines. First of all, we didn't capture the experience of all women at the time. We did some women that we knew a lot about and there's more work to be done. So it's an ongoing struggle because creating knowledge is an ongoing phenomenon. Number two, I'll just make this personal. I'm not gonna go theoretical on anyone. It's not my orientation, but black women's historians and philosophers have pioneered this concept of intersectional analyses. What do they mean and what do I mean when I say it? When I worked with Paige, I'm a white woman, I'm Jewish, and I've been out as a lesbian like forever since I was way too young, it was a public fact about my life. So that brings us like to 1970-ish. When I worked with Paige, there was absolutely nothing about my identity as a lesbian represented in the materials we did. But, my, but a lot about the history of white women resonated for me in my experience. Now, as I guess we'd say, a white lesbian who's lived in various regions of the country, I might add, I'm not just from one place, who has a disability of a visual impairment, you cannot understand me in two dimensions, just as a woman, just as a white woman. My experience as a visually impaired woman brings with it other dimensions. And the whole concept of intersectionality is merely, we have multiple dimensions to our, our identities. By the way, it's as true of men as women, <laughs> just to add that. <laughs> there are some identities that are more stigmatized than others. And if I could just say this, it, it is not an indictment of anyone who did the women's history survey, but the first takes on it were um, 
involve very few stigmatized identities. That's all I would say. Not so many bad girls, in my opinion. <laughs> well, how did you take that idea and apply it to buildings and places? Well, I'm going to actually jump ahead to some current work I'm doing, just so you can see it more clearly. Um, I've now been, um, I joined a collective with several of my graduate students, and we're working on making sites of disability history visible, mapping them digitally, encouraging advocacy around their preservation, and raising the larger issue, period, of how well have we addressed disability history at places. I feel fortunate that I've had some skills throughout this entire process that allow me to read the built environment like others who are skilled at material culture. Because you can speak to this, Martha, but to what degree is learning to use buildings and landscapes as sources a part of history department curricula if they don't have public history programs like your early program? Tell me. <laughs> hey, yeah. I mean, reading material culture, reading, especially for women's history, reading the landscape, right, yeah. And then you took that whole idea and you said, we're not gonna just look at a building at a moment in time or its association with one group, but we're gonna do something really different. And you gave these great examples of buildings um, a lot on the West Coast, where there were multiple identities, multiple stories associated with the site. Well, I'm going to credit Donna in that article on intersectionality with not only doing the research that has all those layers embedded in it, but she had a political point, an activist point, which is right now on the political landscape where we are so fragmented. Don't we want to recall examples that give us hope about bridge figures and communities or bridging moments where, where multiple groups work toward the same goal? Oh, I'm so in need of inspiration and hope along those lines. So I thought it was her leap about the reason why we should do it, not that we do it. And you're a big advocate of coalitions and multiple groups working together on, on projects, on sites, on landscape. Can you talk a little bit about that? I'm concerned about the state of the field and how I may have contributed to it in a negative way. You know, you were present at an honor how powerful it was to run with, in a team, in a group, three national conferences in a row about women in historic preservation. Can I ask you what it meant to you at the time? Oh, it, it was, it, it was like a rays of sunshine pouring down on me. And it was so thrilling to me that there could be a whole different way of seeing landscape and buildings. And there were just, uh, it just felt exciting and innovative. And I must say, and then I heard you give the closing plenary sort of summing up a lot of the key ideas in the conference and everyone was energized after that first conference for sure. And I had a hard decision to face. I'm gonna just tell you honestly, I had written a dissertation that had a publisher and I, I could have carved out this path to be the expert on women and historic preservation. I thought it would be a wrong move politically because what we needed was a movement. And I felt maybe 300 experts were created in the process who would be able to take action wherever they stood whether it was the state of Pennsylvania in a project Kim Moon did that had multiple sites working together to improve the interpretation of women or 
any of the other projects that were involved. And um, I was sick of my dissertation anyway by then, but but the the notion that you could create a movement around it as opposed to an expert really mattered to me. Did that help to lead you to the sort of movement approach to marking sites of importance to people in the LGBTQ community? Because you were, I think, and please tell me, I, I, it seemed to me you were an early innovator in that, but I, I'm going to guess that you're going to say, oh, no, there were so many colleagues that I was working with and who inspired me. You know, I'm going to say that. And I don't feel I led. I just felt like I was willing to say some uncomfortable things and be a thorn in the side of people who mattered, like egging them on. Um, this is completely a joke. It's teasing, but you know, the keeper of the National Register was Carol Schull at the time, and she was so sympathetic to doing women's history, but I could see somewhere between Congress and Carol, there was real fear about being pushed to enter LGBT history as a field for the National Park Service. So what I would say is, it's not unusual in social movements for grassroots things to happen outside the institutions. In New York City, there still is, and I encourage anyone who cares about this topic to look at the digital mapping work of New York City's project along those lines. They're really the model project. And so the members of that collective worked very closely with federal employees to get Stonewall Inn designated. So inside, outside work where some groups can do the pushing the edges and others can advocate within, I think that's actually how movements work. It worked that way for women's history. It, it worked that way for gay history. But I tease about Carol Schull because like what I say is I held her hand when she had to go to the first panel on the subject because it was scary. It was nerve wracking about what direction the park service was gonna go. And things were not that fun under conservative presidents. So what I would say is I was willing to speak out about this issue in many different places. The first panel at the National Trust Conference with others and just tell my story that here I was, a gay person in preservation who could not see themselves in any of the sites, that there were euphemisms like friend, friend, yeah, there were friends and more, or, you know, there were uh, dismissive approaches or a sense that it was wrong to out someone. But times have changed. Megan Springate led a marvelous study, theme study on the topic, and it's free and like 1,200 pages. It's mind blowing. And in there is a wonderful explanation of how intersectionality works with one's sexual and gender and racial and other identities. So if people are interested, read her chapter. It's phenomenal. Um, what I would say is I just was willing to come out about being a queer preservationist. And now there are multiple projects all over the country, including in Tennessee, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right here in Nashville, they're doing some fabulous work. Um, I think Sarah Calise, one of our graduates is really at the forefront of some of that. And it was also like thesis writers in preservation and public history programs who did the earliest work. They were like, I'm going to make this meaningful to me. I'm going to write about this topic. But you also made a point that a lot of the sites, even in queer history, were to middle class or elite white gay men and the importance of remembering that the 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 queer community is multifaceted, multivocal, and sometimes lesbians are left out or trans women. Well, a very simple example. 
that touches on your point about intersectionality. Racial segregation, even among gay male bars, back in the day, was extreme. And attitudes about race and beauty and all that were very important until you understand how these bars or house parties or sites mapped out given racial segregation, do you fully understand gay as a category? So that's just a starting place. But, you know, there are also sites that were maybe difficult to talk about because you kind of got to talk about explicit sexuality. How have military bases treated the issue? What about Lafayette Square right, right across from the White House, which was a gay cruising place in addition to being very significant site in all kinds of civil rights movements. So like, it was fine to talk about respectable sites at first, but whoa, once you start actually talking not about sexuality, but sex, it got a lot harder to do the work and required really, as we find with each of these topics, addressing difficult subjects in public, where people start to worry, what if a kid sees it? Will they be influenced? I mean, if we're worried, that Michelangelo's David is obscene, imagine. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I want to make sure we touch on too is your work in documenting uh, the importance of sites uh, uh, in the Japanese community, um, Asian um, and but especially Japanese and don't you've done some really beautiful things on that and uh, e looking at the effect of internment on their careers but especially looking at the sites and so I was wondering uh, if you could talk more about doing that work and how you as a, a non-Asian person were received uh, within the 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 Japanese community, and then by your peers in the historic preservation community. So the context is I had worked on one site in Los Angeles before I got a tenure track job at University of Washington and was supposed to revise my dissertation to publish, right? But Washington State issued a call, and I was hungry, assistant professor, issued a call to just kind of get a feel for what properties might be associated with Asian Americans in the state. Now, this is a warning to all you young people who are hungry. It was a $15,000 contract that involved every single county in the state. Don't do it. It's not enough money. And I've done a lot of that kind of work and I know better, so I'm just protecting you now. But I agreed to do it in a team with historians and with scholars in Asian American studies, because I knew the method of how to do it. I did not know the content. So that was my first project. And here's what I found. Um, the three most significant groups in Washington state were Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, and Filipinos, much less in pastimes with buildings involved. Korean or South Asian Indian and so on. So I, I had learned, I had taught myself a method for identifying sites, which involved ethnic newspapers, ethnic city directories to link the scholarship, what we knew about immigration, settlement, work and so forth to a place, I had it down pat and it worked out very well but I didn't know communities. I, I had, I just arrived fresh from Los Angeles to ruin Washington state, right? So, um, but the team I was in helped me make contacts. And I found in the Chinese American community, it was actually a rather poor time for me to work with community. It was a lot of um, self-empowerment, and attempts to uh, prepare students to do this work. 
So I did that project, but I didn't go further. In the Filipino community, there were very few sites because they were the poorest of the Asian immigrants and they had rental halls for their community meetings. And there were other properties, farmsteads and so on, but it was much more limited findings. But Japanese Americans, maybe I had the right person to introduce me. Someone introduced me to their uncle. Their uncle said, you want to be at the daycare, I mean, at the benefit for the nursing home with a slideshow right behind the Rice Krispie squares where everyone's going to buy them. And like, then I got a grant that allowed me one year to go to 30 community meetings, to go to their meetings and be a luncheon speaker and show the same slideshow about sites I thought might be significant. And in the process, I got grounded. And I thought it was a project, not a way of life. But as it turned out over time, I got more and more involved in the community and in organizing the community to care about preservation. Because it started out those old buildings, not how do we save our heritage. So I felt like I was doing really fundamental work. That said, nothing makes me happier than preparing graduate students from the community to carry on the work. And that's in place. And my role has receded to kind of giving an overview of what I know about the field and the built environment, more scholarly than engaged. Plus, I'm older now. I can't go to evening meetings 10 times, you know? But I did then, and it made a huge difference. And I feel like we know American history better for knowing Japanese American history and heritage. Why do I say that? The time I was doing my work, redress movement was still active. And there was a large federal civil liberties fund to do work on wartime incarceration, to make it public. Because if this is not part of your knowledge set, what I would say is we ended World War II believing that the incarceration of people of Japanese ancestry was, quote, military necessity. And as Japanese Americans organized, they made it clear it was an unjust abrogation of their civil liberties, period. Reagan issued the apology checks as part of redress were issued, but in public memory, it had not yet filtered into American consciousness how extreme this was. And I think it's only, it's that conversation from the community, but it is also the work that's been done on, on the camps, on the internment camps like Manzanar and Minidoka, Heart Mountain, Amachi the actual physical presence, even where reconstruction has been involved, have made all the difference in terms of Americans understanding this chapter. So that when we ask the question after 9-11, should we be rounding up people? They asked the question during the AIDS crisis, should gays with AIDS be rounded up? And I have to say, it is this public memory of the incarceration as unjust that was a basis for countering those perspectives. Now, I didn't do work about the camps. I thought there were an army of workers publishing books and making sure the camps could be uh, visited and be part of the national park system. I worked on the community before the war on identifying the resources which were so impacted by removal and property um, liquidation. Why? I thought you can't understand the impact of the internment unless you look at the world they made. And that comes from being Jewish, that knowing what shtetl life was like, right? Before World War II, 
the richness of it, the cultural traditions help you understand the impact if you didn't know what was before. So I worked on the unpopular topic of outside the camps. And you were uh, welcomed into the Japanese community to do that kind of work. Well, here's what I would say. I met with a lot of warmth. Um, my skills as a good granddaughter really came into play, as I'm sure they do for you, in terms of oral histories and people's willingness to talk with me. I had a lot of disadvantage in the sense of, or, or maybe it just wasn't appropriate for me to do this work, given that I knew so little when I started. I made some really notable mistakes. But the thing was, I think there was appreciation of, from people of, I wanted to hear their stories. So when I gathered five or six elders to talk about when they were kids going to language school, they turned into kids again. They were like, yeah, I put extra coal in the stove so the teacher would have to stay late. Then she told my parents and I got in trouble. So it just was human, right? It was telling story, appreciating it and linking it to places. I want to ask you one more thing before we open it up to our audience for questions. And that's um, just to say something about your current work with disability rights and the site that you're launching this week. Yeah, so I lost my vision about six or seven years ago. I'm sighted in one eye, not so well sighted in the other right now. And it's a chronic problem. It took me years to learn to really fully work again. And I had to do so in a team with access assistance. When I got my feet under me again, I started to wonder about my students in the class who had disabilities and had to have individual accommodations. And I just thought, What's this? What if this environment were universally accessible as a teaching and learning environment? What if we assume there are many disabilities hidden in the room? So first we started working on making the classes more accessible than the work products from the classes. And more recently, we formed as a collective called Repair that together is mapping digitally, sites of disability history. It uses the ArcGIS technique of story maps to essentially have online exhibits about each site and to advocate for not just compliance in terms of making sites accessible, but a far more radical idea about what full access means, both in person and digitally. In April, we'll launch our new website that's about mapping disability history in the US. We're in our last stages. We aim for the website to be fully accessible or maximally accessible to people with all sorts of abilities. And I would say, just kind of to close it, you know, I started out in a way as a student of Dolores Hayden and Paige Putnam Miller taught me so much work for the National Park Service. I was a student. I'm learning from my students now. First of all, can we just say my students and yours are digital natives? I'm just an old lady trying to keep up. <laughs> Number two, they know subjects in US history that I didn't learn and I haven't been able to keep up with. Two examples, indigeneity, absolutely. Second, colonial, colonialism, decolonizing American history. So they're able to produce interpretations that are exactly as intersectional and multi-layered as you might imagine. Their understanding of disability isn't limited to the 19th and 20th century. They're right about Puritans and disability. And so the women I work with, Sarah Pollocky, Laura Lepping, and others, 
are leading and I'm following. So I have great hope for our students in terms of what they know that we don't, that's gonna transform the field. Like me when I was younger, they're a bit of a thorn in my side in the sense that I was as critical of Dolores Hayden and Paige Miller for what they couldn't see about LGBT history at the time as my students are of me for the limits in what I can see given how I was trained. But from my time being an administrator, I learned something about effective teaching and learning. Uh, and, it, and it's from the sciences. It's that vertical teams that range from undergraduates, graduate students, doctoral students, postdocs, faculty, vertical teams are more powerful than hierarchical teams. So I'm going with it. <laughs> That's great. Well, let's let's let me invite my colleague uh, uh, Dr. Pankreed Dubey to come in and um, she has some of the questions from the audience. Thank you, Martha. It's really been wonderful. Hi, Dr. Dubrow. So we have lots of questions for you. Um, so I'm going to start off with a question that um, came up first. Uh, Anna Levy Chavez um, asks, how do you present various public perspectives on a place when they directly disagree with each other? Well, isn't that the Enola Gay case? writ large, where military veterans really um, were concerned first that their perspective be represented, and second that the, I would just say, uh, perspective critical of the atomic bomb um, kind of was in offensive or insulting to veterans. I think we need to increase our skills at public negotiation and mediation, first of all. And second, I do believe in facts, not just opinions and perspectives. Last, room to respond in public, to have fora and uh, public dialogue is critical, given that. But I think it's a national issue of how you mediate differing perspectives. It's kind of at the tear the statue down or preserve it level. And that's one we're facing across the country. My, my point is, are we teaching these skills? Okay, thank you. So I'm going to, um, there's a common theme that's come up with several questions. So I'm gonna kind of bunch them together um, if you're you know, comfortable with that. And a lot of them are on this common theme of obstacles that you faced personally um, and the kind of progress that you see happening. So my, one of my students has asked, Carolyn Offit has asked, um, you know, what are you most proud of in regards to the progress made in women's rights and LGBTQ rights? and how the amount of scholarship uh, you know, had, with uh, women of color has uh, you know, increased since you started. Do you think, do you see any improvements? Uh, another student wants to know, uh, you know similarly about your struggles as uh, working on women's history in a male dominated field. That's my student writer. Um, and you know, some of them uh, want to know about your personal uh, experience as, you know, being a member of this discriminated group, uh, the LGBTQ community at a time, you know, when there really just wasn't any, any sort of recognition. So if you could tell a little bit about how you see change over time uh, happening, um, or if you think, you know, there hasn't been enough change. And I'll just um, say one, one more uh, way coming at this is, um, so my student Grace wants to know about the process of getting marginalized groups represented 
Um, Haley Wilson wants to know what the most common obstacles you have faced while attempting to bring visibility to some historical sites and how you've persevered. I don't mind talking personally, um, if y'all would like me to. Um, I made a really bad strategic mistake of coming out my junior year of high school because then I had to stay another whole year. <laughs> I should have done it on exit, but you do it when you got to do it. And um, I face serious obstacles because um, my high school guidance counselor chose to interpret my coming out as sick and wrote that to colleges. So I had limited college choice in a, in a high school where it was expected we'd go on to college because it was a science and math high school. So for talented kids. So um, it directly impacted me. And I would also say I came out at a time before the American Psychological Association stopped considering homosexuality as a mental illness. So I had my own questions about whether it was okay. Now, I'm a reader. I read everything in New York City's public libraries, like local branch and like right at 42nd Street to figure out whether I was sick or not. And there was nothing there. And all I can tell you is it was a hard way to enter the world. But based on what I understood about what people thought women should be, I think I extrapolated, like there might be other ways of being and so on. Now, structurally, I am unlike some of you in the sense of, I went through architecture. 1% of registered architects were women at the time I entered. Lucky no one told me. I just didn't know. And still, when you look at a kind of stair step of honors in the field of architecture, a lot of archite female architecture students, like half the classes, you get to principals and firms, ones who are declared fellows or at the level of honors I've received. It's narrow, narrow, narrow as you go up. There are many reasons for it, expectations about parenthood and so forth, gender stereotypes may not be worth the reward in terms of what the income is and what you go through. Who knows? The field has is better now, but that choice really made my path more difficult because it was a much harder field in history and English fields that were more accepting of women or stereotypical, I don't know. It, it would have been a hard path, but not this hard. Now, hope. How about hope? Because I think that's what we're looking for. Wow, has the field generally changed. In historic preservation today at the NAS, go, go like half listen to me and type on your computer and type in National Trust for Historic Preservation, women, Latinos, AAPI, gay, like they're, they're interest groups. Their advocacy groups look at the National Park Service. There is not a topic you can type in that I've mentioned tonight that is not well represented in some way. I think all of these groups realized, and I remember these debates about whether forming interest groups for all these outsiders was gonna alienate the old guard. Think of your preservation societies. Think of mine in Minnesota. It, it, some people are quite conservative. They, they care about the things related to their genealogy. And um, I love it that they wanna save their past. I just don't center it as the only past in America. That's the difference. So there are advocacy groups now if you feel isolated in your interest, there's groups to join. If you want to take action, 
There are projects funded often by some of the most innovative foundations like the Mellon Foundation, but there are projects. You want to identify gay sites in Nashville? You could go tomorrow and help. So there is no need to be isolated, hopeless about doing the work. There are allies and advocates within the National Trust at the highest levels, within the National Park Service. And there's jobs that are intended to remedy gaps like this and build communities of interest for all the American people. That's pretty phenomenal. Now, am I impatient? Yes, I've always been impatient. And I have my agenda for changes I wish would happen by the time we sign off tonight. But I know there is a mass movement. It's not a few lone individuals. No one has to bear the cost of being that brave anymore. And I know it's changed the landscape in ways that make me feel a lot better than when I was a kid and I was packed in the station wagon because my mother liked history and went off to Gettysburg and it was just a choice between blue and gray hats. It's different. You could find yourself, see yourself mirrored, almost whoever you are. And if not, there are models for how to organize in the same ways. Now, my wish is that instead of being many minorities fighting for more sites, it's that we became the majority and had literally the power and control to set the policies and practices. I think about it a lot in terms of disability. If this were a world where people of every ability were welcome, what even would our um, college look like? What would an architecture studio look like? I asked our new department head, if everyone were blind. Are you willing to design our curriculum that way? Or do they need a special exception? So I'm looking for a world in which we really are all welcome. And I'm starting to see it, but you know, there's a big backlash too. So it's a constant struggle. Did that answer the question or did the people who asked those questions want to know more? Um, I let them post in chat, but meanwhile, I do, I have a couple of questions that are related to some things that you've said. Um, so one of them is uh, from our graduate student, Thomas Hudson, who wants to hear you talk about um, today's political climate and how you think it would adversely affect the recognition of sites that focus on the histories of marginalized peoples. Um, and another thing that you sort of touched on briefly um, is, you know, the, the archival, the genealogical. Um, and we have a student, uh, Shelby, who said, you've discussed intersectionality tonight. Do you think that practices in other fields of public history, let's say archival studies, help to create such marginalization of places or sites over time? So okay. kind of- if you, if you would hold the first question in okay. mind, I'll answer the second, just because it's the most recent sure. thing you said. So it kind of depends on where you're located, doesn't it? What the political climate is. I've been stunned by the power of governors to set the climate in states. I'm a blue state gal. Why? Because I'm also a parent. And when I've had opportunities, say, to hold a position in Florida at a university and so on, neither my spouse nor my child would um, be equal citizens. They would not have benefits. And my career would be threatened now in a pretty volatile climate where any individual instructor can be targeted. Well, I guess you could be targeted for not being woke enough or too woke. You can't quite get it right, right? <laughs> so it depends where you're located. 
But either way, um, efficacy hinges on organizing. And uh, you can't be one. I was right without knowing it when I was younger, that being an individual like um, leader was not gonna be enough to make change. And it couldn't be more true today that being organized matters. Um, again, when I think of the curriculum of our programs, uh, our educational programs, I really do think political organizing and negotiation, mediation in circumstances of conflict, as well as the obvious like ethnographic methods and so forth really matter. Now back to archivists who are my people. I just love my archivists. I just finished a project for the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum. It's part of the Smithsonian Network to identify Asian American and Pacific Islander architects, landscape architects and designers. And it's a really big expansion on what Franklin Odo was able to do. What we identified in that study is to get to the point where you can preserve the landmarks, even of AAPI architectural history, and who are the notable people, there's a precursor, which is what's in the archives? What have we collected? What I've found is that archivists are absolutely committed in all of the places I've gone to diversifying their collections. And they care about intersectional issues as well. Um, but I suspect within the organization that I'm most active, which is the Society of Architectural Historians, that all of their affinity groups about women in architectural history and AAPI arch I think all of them have come to the same conclusion. We need to ver diversify the archives so that we can, and I also think the work we do is expanding and creating the archive. And I wonder if that isn't your belief too. I think I think that you've covered both the questions that we were both posed by graduate students here at MTSU. Um, so I have a question that's a bit more uh, direct, um, and you know I'm, I'm going to bunch it with uh, a few more questions, sort of related to that, that have to do with the specificity of your um, expertise geographically, um, the minutiae of how you know, you're, you're dealing with um, overcoming some of this homophobia and sexism in your daily work life. Um, and I have uh, a question from Mary Shell, who wants, um, you know, a, a pretty uh, direct question on places that are related to women in the African American civil rights movement that you think need to be documented. Um, and then I have a question from uh, you know, uh, one of my students, Avery, um, who wants to know about your experience with sexism and homophobia in your line of work. So kind of just the dailiness of, of uh, you know, academic life and yeah. facing all those, you know, in a daily way, we have all these ideals, but, uh, you know, how to uh, sort of talk about that minutiae of, of daily grinding down. I was going to use the word grind because it involves that friction that wears you down. Yeah. So the first one was about African-American women in the civil rights movement. We are so well organized now to mark those places in DC right now. There's a National Park Service supported project that has these layers of women's history, civil rights history, all the way through disability history, and they will intersect. And I love the sites like Lafayette Square that intersect in terms of African-American civil rights, as well as the disability rights movement. Fabulous. It's a case where the Black Panther Party so supported the disability rights movement 
and borrowed some of its mutual self-help techniques for the benefit of all. So I feel confident that there are Black women in architecture and history and public history, several fields that are leading the field, that are getting positions at the major institutions. And frankly, it's something that coulda, shoulda happened 30 years ago and has only happened in a post-George Floyd moment. So I worry about their vulnerability, right? Under the circumstances. But I feel really optimistic. I want to just say as a principle, I always think when I'm thinking about a topic, like a big topic, I think individual organizations, events, and aspects of daily life. Beware the individual exceptional leader model. Think about organized efforts that made change. There are major events we've missed in terms of the formation of Black women's feminism, for example, as opposed to seeing it as something separate. Can't wait to see what's going to come out of this. There's lots of places to do this work. But you asked about my daily grind. What has worn me down? Well, let me first speak from the present moment about being a person with a disability who grew up with the expectation of being able-bodied and with the privilege, in a sense, of being able-bodied. It's hard to do work in a college of design, much less a whole university that's built around able bodies. Two, one of the great lessons of like crip wisdom is you only have three spoons. How are you going to spend them? <laughs> and in any given day, I have about a tenth of the ability I once had to do things autonomously. I need others, and it's forced a major change. I find it's made me think so hard, not only about the limits in my abilities, what it means to travel to a conference if I had had to come here tonight to be with you. I think about how many of us have been affected by COVID. Long COVID, short COVID, or I might get COVID next week. Just saying, there are a lot more disabled people from COVID without recognizing it that way. And we're still organizing our society as if it were something else. Everyone's being called back to work. I think disability reveals what I would call debility, practices that render people disabled socially, physically, or otherwise. The way we organize academe and parenting, whether you're a student or you're a faculty member, it just makes no sense whatsoever. My partner and I, long separated, have a 29-year-old daughter. Raising a child and trying to get tenure at the same time made me a crappy spouse. Really did, because I was rushing to get the grant application in, and I did not feel, given how I was viewed as other, that... Um, I could afford to slack off. So this thing of like Uber performing, it's just exhausting. And I think it becomes a mental health as well as relationship issue for all of us. And I include men in this who are trying to actively parent. And, and I guess kind of the last dimension of this is I hear a lot of many people of color talking about microaggressions they experience every day. I don't know how much of it was how early I came out and how just ordinary I was about it. This is my life. But there was only one colleague in my entire department who ever invited me out to a meal or into their home. 
and the norms for how one interacts as a professional did not come from female culture, I'll tell you that. First time I tried to talk about my family, I was told by a colleague who was sort of hostile to begin with anyway, we don't talk about personal things. We talk about professional things. Well, I've only feel comfortable as an integrated person, just one person, not split into different dimensions. And so I think it led me to see after many years in planning and architecture for a brief time to seek out like this graduate school environment where it was more a women's culture in terms of how you work. It was a relief for a time till I faced that it was a male culture in upper administration. So um, I feel like I've paid a physical toll over time, a tax that, um, well, I finally have the seniority. I can just say, you know, not really, but it required a level of productivity in every direction of proving myself that no one should have to feel over and above the expectations in the university. I don't know, did you want to respond to it too, in a way, about um, what's the same and what's different? I think I appreciated your, your bringing up, you know, our current moment of COVID, because if we hadn't had so many questions, I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts about, you know, particularly long COVID and how, you know, there's uh, hopefully going to be a change to accommodate um, in, at least in, in our workplaces, you know, dealing with a population that um, gets ill and shouldn't be showing up to work. Um, so how to uh, uh, kind of accommodate them. And, but I, I think, you know, we're conscious of your time. So I don't want to, I don't want to keep you too long, but I did want to um, it, it sort of highlight, you know, we had a thank you from a graduate student. So uh, Shelby Davis says, thank you for your insight and time tonight, Dr. Dubrow. And um, uh, Rocky Strickland, um, just wanted to thank you for this interesting and informative presentation about your work and life experiences. And he really liked the conversational format. So uh, just wanted to highlight that. Thank you so much, Dr. Dubrow. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Strickland, for your family making this available.